Hello, everybody. I have a bit of a cold, so I uh, apologize in advance for any sniffing. Um, so yes, my name is Nico Schout and I work for uh, Metabolic and I will first very briefly introduce uh, who Metabolic is, uh, what we do and why we do it, and then uh, how we do it, <laughs> and then in the end I will discuss two case studies of where we've actually implemented our uh, way of working. So first, who are we? Uh, Metabolic is a consulting and ventures uh, building firm based in Amsterdam. Uh, we are around 40 people from a very um, multidisciplinary uh, background and our goal is to transition the world, world's economy towards a sustainable uh, state. And we do that in three ways. So we have the uh, Metabolic ecosystem. Uh, one part is the consulting branch, one part is the ventures branch and one part is the think tank. And what we do uh, in these different branches, I will shortly discuss now. So in the consulting branch, we provide insights to municipalities, governments and uh, companies on how their material flows are actually flowing throughout their entire process and where they can best intervene. And then gaining knowledge from our consulting, we implement that knowledge into our ventures and think tank uh, branches. The ventures is actually our own uh, startup factory where we take the knowledge uh, that we uh, feel is lacking in the world and implement it into new companies. An example is Spectral, which is a company focusing on smart energy grids where people can exchange energy via blockchain technology. And the other one is the think tank where we actually do in-depth uh, research together with uh, knowledge institutes and our main goal of the think tank is to connect, investigate and to design. Uh, working with also like generating knowledge uh, which we feel is lacking within the circular uh, world at the moment. So why are we doing this? I will go through this really briefly because I have the feeling there are a lot of experts uh, at this table but oh. uh, we live in expen exponential times. Over the past few decades the amount of consumption materials has been growing exponentially and uh, as you can see uh, it's not just uh, population or the amount of materials we consume but also the amount of CO2 we emit. And having this exponential growth curve means that we actually can reach tipping points. And these tipping points means that uh, at a certain point uh, we have consumed so much that the current ecosystem is no longer usable or can no longer be used in the same way as we are used to. And to assess these tipping points we use the planetary boundaries, which actually are nine boundaries which you can pass uh, and then create this tipping point to create this system which is no longer uh, sustainable or usable. So how it works, the center in the green area, you're actually very good in the go. And, but then when you come between the orange and the red line, you are reaching the tipping point. So you can uh, come close to this problem where you have disrupted the ecosystem that you're living in. So for instance, we have here the climate change. Um, we've all heard the one and a half, the 1.2 degrees uh, degree uh, Celsius rise. So if we were to reach those 1.2 degrees, we would actually reach the red boundary and then cross it, which would mean that the ecosystem as we know it no longer works. And trying to assess all these different parameters on a constant basis with all the interventions and sustainability uh, we propose, sustainability interventions we propose, we try to make sure that we can actually curve those <laughs> growth curves down and make sure that the ecosystem that as we know it can be used on a more continuous basis. And we think that the circular economy is a method or a system we can use to actually get back within these planetary boundaries and grow the curve. So we see the circular economy not as a goal, but as a means. Um, yeah. And to make sure that we keep within the planetary boundaries, we ha have derived our own system of the seven pillars of the circular economy. What f uh, because for us, the circular economy means not just material flows, but also focusing on energy and water and biodiversity. Because if we c were to just focus on material, uh, but with recycling or the closing of material loops, you would use so much more energy or so much more water, then we're not really building towards this more sustainable future. The same with biodiversity. And what we think is also very important because we're talking about economy, so also about people, is that we think also about human culture, health, and value beyond financial and to make sure that with every step we take, we don't forget the people uh, living in our urban metabolistic uh, cities. So why do we focus on cities? We believe that cities are a huge leverage point. So globally only 3% of all the land surface is occupied by cities, but, it's but they are responsible for 75% of all our material consumption. 
and responsible for between 60 and 80 percent of all CO2 greenhouse emissions. So if we can tackle cities, then we've tackled such a big part of the problem that we are almost, <laughs> almost there. So to, thi to start thinking about economy, we need to transform our cities, we need to redesign our cities, and we need to think differently about how we plan our cities. But how do you translate all these goals into very clear actions? And that's what we've been focusing on over the past seven years as a company with our own methodology. Uh, we like to use a four-step ap four approach. So we start by where are we now, having the current state analysis of a city, then going to where do we want to go as a city, so what's the goal, what's the point on the horizon we want to work towards, then how do we get there, what interventions can we use to actually take the first steps, and then once we've but once we have the interventions, we need to start taking action. So how can we create business cases for local businesses, but also for municipalities, municipalities to get started on this transition? And we do this type of assessments through all layers of the city, so all the way from, uh, from, <laughs> from buildings to, uh, to, regional, uh, to the regional scale. So going a bit more in-depth into this process, when we start with the current state analysis, it can look something like this. This is a material flow analysis that we did for Rotterdam, where on the left we can see all the flows that go into the city, so the energy, the food, the consumption, the building material, the health, uh, the, the medicines, and then what's coming out of the city, so all the water, the mineral waste, the, the building waste. But what we think is most important is to s see where this waste is actually going, so what's happening with the waste. So it can be recycled or it can be incinerated, and then when we look at these material flows, we can also take it one step further. This is for a project we did in Charlotte in the United States, where you can actually see all the waste that is a has a very high landfill uh, capacity, so that like a lot of the waste is actually being put into the ground. We can also make spatial MFAs to see where within a city uh, uh, several material sources can be found and holes and Doing it this way, you can start thinking about making uh, decentralized building hubs to actually close the material uh, loops on a, on a more decentralized scale. And having a look at the supply and demand. So this is a scan we did based on the um, building calendar for a city in the Netherlands, where you could see for each year the amount of materials that would be needed to go into the city to build all the new materials and all the materials that would be released due to de deconstruction uh, uh, projects. So in this way, you can we create very clear guidelines for all the city officials to make sure that if they want to have completely circular buildings or if they want to build with just waste material, they will need to find a different source because they don't have enough within their own ecosystem. Uh, another project we are working on is the repair project. It's together with the AMS Institute and the TU Delft, which focuses on um, bio-based uh, material flows within the metropole region of Amsterdam. And this is an interactive chart which real life shows how material flows go through the city, uh, go in and out and uh, within the city. So that if you want to start a circular business case and you want to start working with this type of materials, you know where they are and how to interact uh, with these material flows. Then, once we've created this current state, so you know where you are at this moment, we can start thinking about vision and KPIs. And these vision and KPIs, are um, we do this according to our own seven pillar framework so that you know within every uh, project that you do, you're not just thinking of the material but also of the energy and also of the people because we believe that's necessary to create a holistic and more sustainable future. And uh, to make all these interventions measurable, we work with key performance indicators. Uh, so that with every decision that you make, you don't just have a good feeling about it, but you can also really measure the impact of the decisions you make and also how these decisions and interventions uh, contribute to your overall goal, so your vision in the, in the long run. Yeah, and this is another <laughs> example. Um, and then once you know these uh, key performance indicators and uh, the point on the horizon where you want to go, we can start thinking about interventions. And what we think is really important is that these interventions are matched to the amount of material you have, but also the type of the material and the scale that you're uh, working on. Different interventions work for the spatial uh, level or the spatial planning or for the built environment or even the building level. 
And also within a city, it's important to look at typologies and the type of people there, because maybe in a very urbanized, dense city center, the same type of intervention doesn't work as more on the, on the borders of the city. And what is, of course, most interesting is to see how the different needs of these people can maybe link with each other, so how the city center can deliver to the ur more urban rural part and vice versa. And then, uh, of course, the idea that different flows require different scales. So it might be possible to have a grey water system within your own home, but if you want to start recycling metal packaging, it's maybe not even enough to uh, work uh, with the Netherlands as a whole. So that's something we also keep in mind to make sure that the um, interventions you do actually fit the process or the project that you're uh, working on. And then we start looking at the impact assessment to make sure that with every intervention that you do, you work towards the goal as effective and price efficient as possible. So for instance, this is a project we did in America again, uh, where we have the potential revenue versus uh, the amount of material that's going to landfill now versus the size of the bubble, which is the amount of jobs you can create. So there you can see plastic, it's uh, a lot of jobs can be created, a lot of revenue can be created, but uh, on an overall material scale, it's not the most. So having insight in these key performance indicators um, gives city officials the, um, the possibility to make the decisions best suited to their, um, to their project. And then uh, from that onwards, you start working on the business cases. We do this always with local stakeholders to make sure that the people who are working there and who will need to take on this business case can, have a can play a vital role within this uh, project. And in the end, we also try to calculate how this business case can actually land and what the revenue will be uh, created for the, for the local context. So that's a lot of information and I will try to <laughs> illustrate it a bit more clearly on, uh, on two case studies that we've actually done. Uh, the first one is the Keuvel, which is a uh, polluted piece of land within the city of Amsterdam. It used to be a, a shipyard. And then in 2006, the municipality... Um, 2008, sorry. Um, wrote out a competition for people to actually interact with this piece of land and create a sustainable and circular um, clean tech playground. So we, together with two uh, other companies, enrolled and we actually won uh, this tender. And what we did is we cre created a, uh, to get with a lot of old houseboats, we created a, uh, we call it a vertical um, office space, but also a cafeteria where people can actually experience sustainability and circularity. And we did a lot of research here on how these material flows could co work within uh, this plot, but also going out uh, from the plot, and how this place could be as self-sufficient uh, as possible. So we worked with a lot of houseboats, which we bought and retrofitted and put on land. Um, and now we organize a lot of events there where people who may, may not be as uh, known with circularity or, um, or uh, experience it on a daily uh, level can go and see what it means to live in a more circular neighborhood and also experience what it means working with local material flows. From the knowledge we gained here, um, we started looking at the surrounding area. So the cave was here. But then around it is Bijksloterham, which is an area in the north of Amsterdam which is being uh, redeveloped. And we worked with a lot of other parties to, wor to write a circular manifesto for this uh, piece of uh, Amsterdam, because the city of Amsterdam had the ambitions to make one of the most circular and sustainable areas of the Netherlands here. So taking knowledge we gained from the Keuvel, we upscaled it towards this more uh, um, area uh, development. And we worked on a manifest where we gave guidelines for the new people working and living in this uh, area on how circularity should look and how they can incorporate it into their uh, business model. From this manifest, we also worked on another development in Pijksloterham, which is Schoon Schip. It's the most sustainable floating community in Europe, which is actually a, a lot of houseboats where we went to a very iterative design process together with architects and the residents to see how we, we can create and design such a sustainable and floating community. And from this building process and actually this tendering process, we worked on a uh, tendering document for the municipality of Amsterdam. So 
that uh, now every time they do a new new building project, they have guidelines on how they can actually tender the ground uh, and have circular tendering guidelines. And I think this is a very nice example of how a very small project on a very local scale generated knowledge, which through an, a very long process could be scaled up to a city level and now has a very high impact on how the city of Amsterdam actually expresses their um, goals towards the future. And then another project we just finished, I already uh, mentioned it quite a, few quite a few times, is Circular Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte is a city in the United States and what we did there was we looked at all the material waste coming from the city, so just the waste going out. And what we see is that quite a lot of the um, waste is plastic and almost all the waste is currently being landfilled. And of course that's really a shame if we're thinking about waste from a circular uh, perspective. So what we did there is we looked at all these material flows and at the value creation and uh, the possible revenues that, revenues that could be created with these materials. And we did stakeholder workshops. And within these stakeholder workshops, we uh, created five business cases where we calculated how and uh, what the municipality would have to do to actually implement these business cases. So for instance, one is a concrete recycling chain, because in the next few years, a lot of the material of the pavements within the city were to be uh, renovated. So we said, well, if you invest in this now, you can create a lot of jobs and you have a very vital role in the ecosystem, not just of your city, but also of building processes around it. Another one was about upcycling food, because now a lot of the food was being composted, but actually a lot more high value uh, um, solutions could be found for this. Another one was about material innovation and how the municipality could stimulate local entrepreneurs uh, with this material innovation hub. And especially this last one I think is really nice because this is the, the barn. It's an uh, existing barn within uh, Charlotte where we're working on now together with the municipality and architects to create this ecosystem where local entrepreneurs can come, learn about ecosystems, learn about uh, material innovation, but also invite uh, citizens to experience what circularity means and how they can interact it with it uh, in their own lives. And from all these five business cases, um, all these five business cases are actually currently being implemented, uh, which means that we can um, deviate 150,000 tons of waste on a yearly basis in the city and generate a huge amount of jobs so that the city can actually uh, boost their own local economy. Thank you.